This is VOA Africa. Good evening, I'm Esther Gidu Yurt. This is Africa 54. On this special edition of Africa 54, exploring the African origins and history of America's slave trade. Twenty nineteen marks the four hundredth anniversary since the first enslaved Africans set foot in what is now the United States. The arrival in the British colony of Virginia in August sixteen nineteen of a ship carrying Africans from Angola marked the start of more than two hundred years of slavery in America. BOA's Myra de la Salette and Betty Ayub traveled to Angola to learn more about the transatlantic slave trade and its lingering impact on the region. Here is Myra with that report. In 1619, a European ship landed in colonial Virginia with an unexpected cargo. At least 20 enslaved Africans, the first in America. These captives, from what is now the country of Angola, had survived a treacherous Atlantic crossing, only to face more suffering, a fate shared by hundreds of thousands of other enslaved Africans in what became the United States. Records of the sale and shipment of Africans appear in many ledgers, telling a horror story of upheaval and exploitation. At Angola's National Museum of Slavery in Luanda, director Vladimir Fortuna says the slave trade's legacy still haunts the country. For almost four centuries, this country, this region that we know today as Angola, was heavily involved in these activities, and this country was harmed in every single aspect. The social fabric was destroyed, and today we live with the consequences of slavery. Centuries of colonial rule combined with slavery fostered conflicts in Africa that increased poverty and instability, Fortuna says. The slave trade destabilized African societies. It wasn't possible during the times of slavery and colonization for African societies to reorganize their political and labor systems. And sometimes people try to forget this part of the country's history. And that's why the National Museum of Slavery exists. This small house and chapel overlooking the sea formed part of Luanda's slave trade. The beautiful view contrasts starkly with the deplorable experiences that happened here. In this building, captives were converted to Christianity before being sent to meet their fate as slaves in the New World. Through baptism, the Catholic Church stripped the captives of their African identity. Those who were detained in Angola were given Portuguese Christian names. They were baptized in big groups and were renamed if and when they reached a distant shore. These people were baptized in mass. Paulino Coteca is a priest in the coastal city of Benguela, south of Luanda. In the past, the church and the state worked together, and the evangelization here in Angola served both the church and colonization, though that mix could be confusing. Father Coteca says these conversions were both good and bad. On one hand, it helped new converts embrace the gospel. On the other hand, it destroyed their identity and their culture. Many of them suffered because of this evangelization. That's why the church apologized later for these mistakes. In 1985, Pope John Paul II asked Africans to forgive white Christians for their involvement in the slave trade. 
The Kwanzaa River, which empties into the Atlantic just south of Luanda, was an important trade route. And people who lived near its banks got swept up in the slave trade. It was by the river where most of the slaves were captured. They were kidnapped. And it was done by the Africans as middlemen. Hurst says slavery drained the region of precious human capital. The workforce, the intelligentsia, the skilled people were taken from here. And today, we need this skilled workforce so that Africa can move forward to a better situation. Portugal officially banned slave trafficking in 1836. But Angola is still trying to recover from its legacy. Now, some six million enslaved Africans came from Angola. Most of them were sent to Portugal's colonies, although some ended up in North America. We learn more about the fierce resistance to the slave trade in this report from VOA's Myra de la Salette. For centuries, beginning in the late 1400s, slave traders in what is now Angola took part in transatlantic human trafficking. Historians say the Portuguese took much of the historical records when they left Angola after its independence in 1975. At the National Archive in Luanda, Januário Silva displayed manuscripts left behind that are at least 300 years old. The name of the slave, gender, place of birth or origin, age, identifying marks, occupation. And at the end are notes where we can see the date of capture or other relevant information. The ledgers also contain letters and other correspondence. This one tells us about a situation involving slaves who have run away with the help or participation of some traditional authorities. While some tribal chiefs profited from supplying captives to the European slavers, other leaders tried to protect their people. One was Njingamband, queen of the Ndongo and Matamba kingdoms in the 17th century. A warrior and diplomat, she fended off the Portuguese and Dutch throughout her 40-year reign. She was the greatest protector of Angolan sovereignty, and it was 40 years of fighting for a woman in the 17th century, and she didn't get killed. She would hide in these floating islands of the Kwanzaa River, so they could never tell where she was. She always resisted, and she always won. But ultimately, the Portuguese slave traders prevailed. They already had taken control of parts of the region since 1482. In 1617, they founded the port city of Benguela. There, this building, which is now Angola's National Archaeology Museum, was once a way station for thousands of human captives, says historian and archaeologist Paula Russa. This was a warehouse. They waited here for the slave ships coming from Europe and the Americas to take them away. The history is painful. Like many others in Benguela, Rusa is descendant from slaves. My mom is dead. I was raised in an orphanage, but my great aunts told me, look, your great grandmother was sent to Recife in Brazil. Of the nearly 11 million enslaved people shipped from Africa to the Americas, almost 6 million came from what is now Angola. Fewer than 400,000 were sent to the 13 American colonies before 1776. Historians say a tiny fraction came from Benguela. We had many American tourists on the cruise ships that you used to dock here, and they wanted to come to this specific place because they said their ancestors left from here. Centuries of colonization and slavery scarred Angola, as did recent decades of civil war. Today, 
The country has the third largest economy in sub-Saharan Africa, but at least a third of its 30 million people live in poverty. Hearst says Angola's female vendors, known as Zungueira, are Angola's every day, Queen Jingas. She's a resistor. You see the Zungueira in action every day. She leaves the house, buys goods from farm women, and sells those goods on the street. She goes back home and pays her kids' tuition, pays the rent, pays for food. Like Njinga, the Zungueira are standing strong for Angola. In Angola, young people are learning about the history of the slave trade in the classroom. Once again, here's VOA's Myra de la Salette. How does a country heal from centuries of slavery and the additional strains of colonization and civil war? It starts with understanding history, says Armindo Jaime Gomes. But Gomes, a historian, says there's not enough scholarly work being done about his country's past, in particular, Angola's link with slavery in the United States. Nós não temos estudos. We don't have the research or publications or institutions dedicated to this subject. We don't have bibliographic references that support what we know, other than what the Europeans wrote in their own way and for themselves. Gomes complains that Western accounts often do not include the barbaric practices. For example, he says after Britain abolished slavery in 1833, the trade continued illegally, and Portuguese slavers were ruthless in avoiding being caught. When British inspectors reached Portuguese ships, they wouldn't find any slaves. The Portuguese strategy was to throw all the black people into the sea when they spotted British ships. The Portuguese would then return to shore and pack the ship up again. On top of that, Angola's curriculum at every grade level has only one chapter on the slave trade, even when we get to the university. At the Colegio Caju Middle School in Luanda, in the studies of slavery, teachers are careful not to provoke resentment over race. We need to make sure our students are well informed about slavery and understand it was in fact a problem. Unfortunately, black slavery is very connected with racism, so we have to be very careful when we're teaching this subject. When I first heard about slavery, that we were colonized by the Portuguese, in a way I felt hatred. It was a new thing for me, but with time, I got to learn that slavery existed way before, and in the ancient times, it was part of the rise of some kingdoms. Kavunga students have different views of slavery's legacy. Even though slavery was a bad thing, it also had its benefits. Slavery helped many countries in Europe, and Africa also got exposed to other cultures. I'd like to tell young Americans, do not hold on to resentment. Now we have to be more correct, have better ideas than our ancestors, and prevent slavery from happening again. Angola's slave history has seeped into the culture, resonating in murals and music. Capoeira is a martial arts form developed by slaves. They used music to disguise self-defense moves. Justino Pinto de Andrade, known to capoeira enthusiast as Faísca, teaches the sport and explains why it remains popular. I think it's essentially related with the musical part. We have Birimbau, for example, the Atabac and Pandeiro, all of them African instruments. Capoeira, without its music, is not capoeira. It's the only martial art in the world that performs to music with instruments and chants. Music is like a stamp 
It's the Africans' brand. Some capoeira songs tell the stories of enslaved black people. One is Negro Inheritance, which Faishka wrote to describe their suffering. For a man to know where he's going, he must know where he comes from, right? Informed by the past, Faishka wants what Angola students also say they want, to move forward. Mayra de la Salette with Betty Ayub for VOA News, Angola. The arrival of the first enslaved Africans in the U.S. state of Virginia was the start of what would become one of the darkest chapters in U.S. history. VOA's Chris Simpkins takes us to the place history was made and reveals how these first African slaves, along with the many who followed and their descendants, shaped the course of a nation. Four centuries ago, a privately owned English vessel named the White Lion sailed these waters carrying human cargo to trade for food and supplies. The ship came up the Chesapeake Bay and it landed here at Point Comfort in the latter part of August of 1619. And on that ship were 20 and odd Africans. Founder of Project 1619, Calvin Pearson, walks the grounds of today's Fort Monroe in Hampton, Virginia. On this strip of land called Port Comfort then, the first enslaved Africans landed in colonial Virginia. It marked the beginning of an odyssey of millions of Africans being brought to America as slaves for more than 200 years. The first Africans who were brought here were destined for a, a life of servitude. Uh, they had to work the plantations from sunup to sunset, the tobacco fields, the corn fields. They had to work these fields with no hope of ever being free. It makes me feel goosebumps and a sad nostalgia. Historian Bill Wiggins says the first captured Africans had no legal status until the Virginia colony formally legalized lifelong slavery in 1661. I just can imagine the sailing into the bay of these chained individuals in a strange land, not knowing anything about where they were, being taken off of the vessel and told, you're going to work here, you're going to live here. Evidence from scarce records indicates more than two dozen Africans were aboard the White Lion. Weeks earlier, the Africans were forcibly taken from a Portuguese slave ship heading to Mexico. These were free people who had been kidnapped as free people and sold into slavery. Two enslaved Africans named Anthony and Isabella, likely from Angola and baptized Catholic, were taken off the White Lion when it reached the shores of Port Comfort. These are the sacred land of our ancestors. And when I walk this land, I think about Antony and Isabella. I think about what were they thinking about getting off a ship in a strange land. This is ground zero. This is the beginning of the African imprint on America. The first Africans were sold or traded to wealthy white plantation owners in Hampton and the Jamestown settlement, which became the Virginia colony. 
A few days after the White Lion landed in Virginia, another ship, the treasurer, arrived carrying a few slaves, including one named Angela. Angela, interestingly, is the only African whose name was actually written in the records in 1620 that survived. Now, there may have been other names mentioned, but those records did not survive. Archaeologists say Angela spent part of her life in Jamestown Settlement, now a national park where archaeologists are trying to unearth clues about her life. With Angela, we, we can tell the much broader story of slavery and the beginnings of slavery in our country and racism, which really went hand in hand with slavery, and at the same time give Angela uh, through our imagination, some sense of identity, some sense of dignity. And it was Angela and so many others that made the colonists prosperous. They did most of the work, and a number of them obviously died in the process, but we owe a debt to those Africans because they were the foundation of the economic development of what became the United States of America. Slavery began in Virginia, and it was at this site where the first actions to end the system took place. During the Civil War, three runaway slaves working for the Confederate Army fled to Fort Monroe, seeking sanctuary from the Union troops there. Union Army Major General Benjamin Butler declared the slaves as contraband or seized goods. That decision eventually provided protection to thousands who sought freedom at Fort Monroe and laid the groundwork for an even broader measure. They forced the federal government and Lincoln to issue the Emancipation Proclamation, which subsequently led, of course, to the 13th Amendment, ending enslavement, and paved the way for the 14th Amendment, which provided citizenship in 1868. Fort Monroe now is a national monument, majestic grounds that future generations can explore to learn more about the early history of an emerging nation. The transatlantic slave trade involved the purchase and transportation of enslaved Africans, mainly to the Americas by Europeans. Those who survived the horrific voyage were destined for a life of servitude to their white masters. Here again is VOA's Chris Simpkins. This is where it is, right? This is the DeWolf Family Cemetery. This is the funeral mound of James DeWolf. It's hard to muster much sympathy for the lack of dignity in this for someone who engaged in slave trading on that kind of an epic scale. James DeWolf Perry is referring to one of his great grandfathers, buried here in Bristol, Rhode Island. Katrina Brown, his cousin, is a direct descendant of the DeWolf family, too. James DeWolf and his extended family brought uh, more than 12,000 enslaved Africans across the Middle Passage and are probably responsible for about half a million people who are alive today in the Americas descended from those who crossed the Middle Passage on their ships. The Middle Passage refers to the sea journey of ships from West Africa to the West Indies. So one of the great ironies of Rhode Island is the fact that we are founded under religious freedom, but we soon enter and dominate the enslavement of human beings in the African slave trade. And even churches were involved. The church, particularly in Rhode Island, profited directly from the slave trade. But in a more direct way, we owned slaves. We had clergy who owned slaves. We had slaves that were owned by the missionary uh, organizations that were creating the Anglican churches here in the United States. And what's exciting about this list is, is that it's something... Newport that historian Keith Stokes says Rhode Island merchants paid for ships to bring more than 100,000 slaves to the New World. Between 1705 and 1805, there are at least 900 documented slave ships that begin in Rhode Island and eventually end from West Africa through the West Indies and back to Rhode Island. It was called the Triangle Trade. They had rum distilleries in Bristol. 
They would take rum primarily as well as other commodities to the coast of West Africa to trade for men, women, and children who were then brought back to be sold at auction either in the Caribbean and primarily that was in Cuba or in the American South in ports like Charleston, South Carolina. The slave trade became a backbone of the American economy. All of this was tremendously important in building the economy of the North and what became the United States. In the colonial era, the slave trade and the provisioning trade to slave plantations in the West Indies um, were a key part of what allowed the British colonies to prosper and eventually to rebel against Great Britain and become an independent nation. At the time of his death in 1837, James DeWolf was the second richest man in America. After Rhode Island outlawed shipping slaves to North America in 1787, his nephew continued the slave trade illegally. George DeWolf was actively involved in the illegal slave trade after 1808. They appear to have stopped being involved by 1820 when Congress increased the penalty and imposed the death penalty for those who engaged in the slave trade. For the southern plantations, the African slaves brought skills useful in growing rice, tobacco, and cotton. Cotton that fueled northern textile mills, including in Rhode Island. James DeWolf heavily invested in the textile mills that turned the cotton into garments fueling America's Industrial Revolution. At the onset of the Civil War in 1861, there were four million enslaved Africans in the United States, a legacy the DeWolf family is trying to reconcile. It's incumbent upon me as someone with this kind of a family history and knowing about this history to speak out about what our family did and to help other people draw the connections to the ways in which their families are connected to slavery. If we bury the dark parts of a family history, if we bury the dark parts of a national history, we will start to assume things like that didn't happen and that will greatly distort our understanding of how we got here today. At the Bristol Cemetery, Katrina finds the grave of one of two family slaves owned by James DeWolf. So it's this horrible story of this image of two children being given as a Christmas present to one's wife. She was called Ajua. Just being here makes me hope that she can hear us and that honor and recognition of their lives is something that can pass through the spirits. Chris Simpkins, VOA News, Bristol, Rhode Island. And that's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. From all of us here in Washington, have a good evening.